Okay, so when I give these presentations, the biggest complaint I get about technology is not actually about the use of cryptography. It isn't about whether I'm using the right algorithms, or whether they're strong enough, or even whether this new meta cryptography is secure. No, what really upsets people is the idea that they might have to use ASN1. Okay, so in this presentation, PKCS7 in JSON. Hello, I'm Philip Ann Baker, and this is uh, the eighth of my podcasts explaining the technology of the mathematical mesh. So I've shown metacryptography, key splitting, key combination, that type of stuff. And I've shown a new revised way to do fingerprints. In this presentation, I'm going to be showing you the mesh approach to cryptographic message format. And this particular presentation is really preparatory for the next one, which is how to do blockchain and more in JSON. Okay, so what's going on here? Right. So, Data at Rest Envelope began as a JSON-friendly version of PKCS7, CMS, whatever. So the idea was that we wanted to be able to support streamed encoding of data, regardless of how le long the data is. You know, if you've got a terabyte of data that you want to encrypt, you don't want to have to buffer all that in RAM or even on disk. You want to just be able to encrypt it all in one chunk. And if you've got streaming video, you've got to be able to encrypt streams, even though you don't know in advance how long the stream is going to be. So we want to be able to support those types of things. And we also wanted to be able to add signatures and Macs and so on in an efficient way, which means being able to which means we need a three parts uh, envelope. So the DARE envelope, it starts off with a head. So the header contains all the control information, uh, tells us which digest algorithm we, we're using, what the encryption parameters are, it, the key decryption blobs for all the recipients, and at the end, it has a trailer. And the trailer has the signatures. And what goes in between is a variable length encoded blob. Um, you don't have to write it all out all at once. You can write it out uh, length, uh, you know, as, as a sequence of frames. So fairly conventional approach to um, a data envelope, just represented in JSON and using all the internals from Jose, that is JSON, signature and encryption. So there are a few little tweaks though, in that uh, Jose is designed to be a really flexible specification that can be used in many different ways. And in the mesh, we take the view that the whole point about st standards is to make decisions that don't matter. The only thing that matters in with these decisions is that you don't do something stupid and that if Alice is talking to Bob, both their devices work in the same way. Apart from that, whether you encode in ASN1 or JSON or whatever really doesn't matter. But, yeah, people have strong views, so let's do it in JSON. Okay, so we can do the efficient encryption of the message body. We can also, and this is in addition to the traditional PKCS7, we can put encrypted blobs into the header. And these are called encrypted data sequences. And the DARE envelope format provides an efficient and secure way of doing that, even when you're using stream ciphers. Uh, stream ciphers have a lot of advantages, but they also have one really major disadvantage, which is that they are fragile. If you mess up with a stream cipher, boy, do you mess up. 
uh, you only need to encrypt the same data twice with the same original key and you're completely gone. So we have a mechanism to ensure that we have the highest degree of assurance that we're doing this in a sensible way and that we minimize the risk of an implementation error causing a disaster. And to do that, we generate all the parameters for our encryption and message authentication from a master key by means of a key derivation function. So we use the HMAC KDF that uh, the ITF has already agreed on and discussed and so on. Um, and that's based on HMAC underneath and yeah. So we're fairly confident about the algorithm. And so what we do is that um, each message head specifies a unique nonce value. So even if we encrypt two pieces of data under the same key exchange, they both have a different nonce. And so the two inputs to our KDF are the nonce value and the key agreement. Or it could just be a symmetric key master secret. So we have a nonce here, a key exchange, and then we add in a different mix-in to get out our initialization ve vector if we're using a block cipher, our uh, encryption key, of course, and our message authentication code, and also a witness value. And this witness value, I'll explain what we use that for later on, but basically there's a traditional problem that comes up in cryptography of do you encrypt and then sign, or sign and then encrypt. And if you go on the net, you can find really passionate statements in favour of both approaches. And people are really sure that one or the other is, and the real answer is no, neither is. There are different security advantages and disadvantages to both, and you actually need to be able to use both for the general case. Okay, so what's an example of using this signature approach in the mesh? Well, when we sign me send mes mesh messages, Alice is sending to Bob, four corner model, so the messages go th out through an outbound server, and are received by the inbound server, and they're encrypted end to end, which means that these two servers cannot see the plain text of the message. However, we want the server to be able to authenticate the messages for our spam anti-abuse mechanism. Every me message is access controlled, so every message needs to be authenticated which means that we've got to be able to check the signature over the ciphertext. Okay, so that's an example where we need the signature over the ciphertext. Why might we need a signature over the plain text? Or rather, why might we want to be able to tell that the signature was authorised by a party that had knowledge of the key exchange data. I'm being very pedantic here because there is a difference between the two and what the mesh does is it provides a signature not over the plain text of the message, instead it provides a witness value that proves that a party that knew the key exchange value intended that the signature be created. So how do we do that? Well, we use a KDF function again. So the key exchange is a key KDF function. And one of the outputs from this is the witness value. Well, what we do here is that we have an additional mix in here, which is the UDF fingerprint of the signing key.
and that means that this witness value could only have been created by somebody who knew the KDF function and also intended to apply it to the key used to sign the message. And so it's an authorization to sign under this key. And that allows us to get the effect of sign, sign, then encrypt, then sign again in a more efficient format. Okay, so in this uh, podcast, I've been showing you how we apply UDF. And we use it inside um, the mesh to provide the equivalent of what I call Ruby on Rails for crypto. If you're familiar with the uh, Rails uh, subsystem for Ruby, the big idea there is simply just have one identifier for a key, uh, for, for a database field, and use it throughout. Have one identifier for a table, and then the computer can work out all the plumbing that's required. Instead of the programmer having to map one set of data fields in the programming language to another. Yeah. Same idea here. We only use the UDF of the key values in order to create key identifiers in the mesh. And that's a very simple, very powerful approach. And I'll show how we make use of that in the next podcast, which is on data at rest envelope. Dare. So please like, please, please subscribe. The more subscribers I get, the more I can show that there is an interest in this work and the more backing I can get. So please like, please subscribe, and please watch my next video on Data at Rest Envelope. Thank you.